You've probably heard me talking about this self-sufficient living skills bundle that's been going on, and I have been spending the last week flipping through so many of the incredible resources within this bundle. Now, I will say there's a lot. There's over 118 different ebooks and courses and lessons sharing incredible wisdom and knowledge with you, so you can live off the land and you don't have to rely on this corrupt and broken system for everything for your family. Anyways, I wanted to share some of my favorite things. One, first off, is off-grid homeopathy. This course is loaded with so much incredible knowledge, talking about homeopathy for first aid, for colds and flu, how to make your own homeopathic remedies. Like, as an herbalist who loves to teach that stuff, that's pretty exciting to hear it in the homeopathy realm. There's also some incredible fermentation guides, so many other amazing herbal recipes and food recipes and how to make your own sourdough bread, how to do your own organic gardening and canning of all of your foods. Really, there is so much. And yes, I know, I know. I've talked about it a ton, but this entire bundle is only $50 right now until Sunday, March 24th. I'm sharing my herbal first aid skills, which is a course that's $47 on its own. I'm sharing recipes that I used when I got my products into REI for herbal first aid kits and so much more. Y'all have to check it out. I'm serious. Like you can absolutely change your life with this bundle. So there is a link in the show notes for you and I hope you check it out. I hope you take advantage. Don't worry. You don't have to go through everything right away. You can access everything for up to a year. Once you're in the course or have the download, it's yours for life. It is a steal of a deal. Okay, self-sufficient living skills bundle in the links for you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Herbalist Path, where we're on a mission to inspire a movement where there's an herbalist in every home again. It was once like that, you know, and there's no reason that today your neighbor's brother's cousin's best friend's sister's neighbor can't start using plant medicine in their own home. So if you love the mission of this podcast and you love this episode up ahead, please subscribe and leave us a rating on iTunes and share it with your friends. Thanks so much for tuning in. And here's to our journey down the herbalist path. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to The Herbalist Path. I'm super excited. Today is our first episode, and I couldn't be more thrilled to share The Herbalist Path with you and all of your friends, too. Um, I wanted to start The Herbalist Path because I want to create a movement where there's an herbalist in every damn home out there. There's no reason that everybody can't use plant medicine within their homes to help their themselves live a healthier, better life. And to help our planet along as well. So hopefully this podcast can inspire some of you to use more plants in your lives. And um, if not, share it with somebody who else who might need it. Hopefully you learn a little something here and there. So I think this podcast is going to be where I interview great herbalists and I do a little bit of my own ramblings about whatever, whatever herbal subject I'm feeling you need to know about each week. And I am beyond and excited to introduce my first podcast guest to you, which is Missy Rose. She is a co-owner of the Arcto School in Portland, Oregon. She's a community herbalist, a total activist, and badass. She's hilarious. And I am so thrilled to have her on this podcast and share some of her stories about the beginnings of herbalism for her. Um, Missy, I don't know if that was a, a good enough intro for you. No, that's perfect. And thank cool. you so much for having me on. It's really an honor to um, be on, but also be kicking off your exciting podcast series. Yay, I'm thrilled for it. I think it's going to be good for all of us. So. so I'm wondering, I know you've been practicing herbalism for quite some time, but can you just go back to like when you first got started in herbalism and how was that? Yeah, this is always a good question and I always have to figure out, do I give the short answer, the medium answer, the long answer? Um, All of them. 
<laughs> so when I was in college, um, I first learned about herbalism as a thing from reading punk scenes. And in punk scenes, there were all these herbal abortion recipes. And I was like, oh, yeah, we're going to stick it to the man. Nobody ever needs a doctor again, which is not exactly how herbalism works. But it was enough to get me drawn in and really interested. Mm -hmm. um, so I dabbled in it a little bit in college and then put it aside and spent the next handful of years after college really just 24 seven doing activism and stuff. And at a certain point I was starting to get really burnt out on organizing things, organizing groups, organizing demonstrations, organizing meetings, organizing all sorts of stuff. And I just wanted a way to keep on doing good social justice work in the world without doing the organizing part, like <laughs> just show up again. <laughs> and I had some friends who were in a group called the Black Cross Health Collective, which was providing first aid at demonstrations. And so I expressed an interest in joining to one of my friends and he is kind of a master of misunderstandings that turn out well in the end. <laughs> so he got me invited into the group and I was like, oh good, they're going to teach me all the first aid I'm going to need to know. And they were under the impression that I already knew first aid. And so I kind of right away wanted to get up to speed on that front. But I also quickly realized that I was surrounded by emergency room nurses and herbalists and massage therapists and nurse practitioners. And I just wanted to learn some more about health stuff. And so I started to take uh, classes from one of those Black Cross members, Colette Gardner, and then quickly started taking classes with another one, Krista Olson. And that was a particular year that I was unemployed, I started a new relationship and my new partner at the time um, taught me how to garden some and just the two of us started going on weekly hikes, which I had literally like almost never been on a hike. <laughs> and so doing that together with her really changed my world too and opened my eyes to the fact that you actually can walk down a path in the forest and know almost all the plants that you see and they can be your friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that just hadn't even occurred to me. It's one of my favorite things about where I live, like knowing the plants I'm walking by and being like, hey, you, how's it going? I haven't seen you in a while. You know, like, yeah. Carry on yeah. with your great story. Oh, and that's, that's, yeah, basically like my in. That was how I fell in love with herbalism. And I just really dove head on into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was practical and it was like magical and that it introduced me to my surroundings it got me connected to this ecosystem I live in mm -hmm. up until that point as I mentioned I've been doing so much activism and I knew that environmental activists were my allies but I was always a little bit snotty about it I was like oh those tree huggers they're cute <laughs> but <laughs> damn hippies and I didn't get it. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, so it sounds like kind of rebellion is what got you into herbalism. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Like the the damn so, the man ism, and then like finding the magic within those plants, cool yeah. stuff like that. So once you like started taking those walks with your partner and and realizing that these plants are real and like you can touch them and you can say hi to them <laughs> and like hang out with them. What did you do from there to go learn more about herbs? Well, I kept on studying with both Colette and with Krista. Um, and both of them offered a number of different classes. So I took um, a couple of years of classes with Colette. And then Krista offered um, a variety of different like shorter series and um, I just really dove into like everything that I could learn from the two of them. I accompanied a friend of mine who was studying with Cascade Anderson Geller on an herb walk that Cascade led. And that was pretty special. Um, and yeah, so I just like did all that. And of course I like read tons of books at home and 
like really got to cuddle up with my Pojar and McKinnon, the yeah. Plants of yeah. the Pacific Northwest. And, uh, Love that book. <laughs> All yeah. copies that I've owned. <laughs> I think I still have the original now, but I don't know where the rest are. I hope I have the original still, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's see, what else did I do? Um, you know, it really helped to have a person in my life that was really interested in what I was learning. So yeah. when I would learn stuff from class, I would take it home and then I would teach it to my partner. And then we'd go on a hike and I'd see the plants in person. And so it was this like self-reinforcing system um, that I had a lot of privilege at the time because I was on an unemployment and had some savings and stuff to really just like be 100% in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that really, that was a huge part of it. And then eventually I, I knew a lot of people who had studied with Michael Moore in the desert Southwest. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking into studying with him mm -hmm. and um, did in fact take that leap and went to go study with Michael Moore and Donna Chesner down in Arizona and was really lucky to catch him while he was still teaching. And that was a big life shifting thing for me too, because I think that was like what made me feel like, oh, this is when I can tell other people I'm an herbalist, you know? Right. Up yeah. Until that point. Yeah. So to that piece, like I'm an herbalist, like when, how, how does somebody finally realize like, oh man, I am an herbalist, you know, because there's, there's so many levels of it, you know, and it gets, I don't know if this was the way for you, but for me, it was, um, it was intimidating. Like, yes, I was studying herbalism. I had made these things. I really dug it, but it sounded like for a while when you first got into the, to the Black Cross Health Collective that you had to fake it till you make it and like go out <laughs> and learn. And that's kind of been a motto for everything I've done in my life. Um, when did you finally say, aha, yes, I am an herbalist? Hey, I wanted to take a quick pause to show some love and gratitude to our sponsors of the Herbalist Path podcast, who make this show possible for me and possible for you too. So here it goes. Medicinal mushrooms are all the rage these days, if you didn't know already. And with great reason, because they are powerful medicine that can improve your health and your life in so many different ways, when they're well made. Yeah, it's true. There's a lot of stuff on the market that isn't going to be so effective. And that's why you need to find a brand that you can actually trust. For me, that brand is Whole Sun Wellness. And this is the creation of a brilliant woman and fellow mama, Jamie Bonfiglio. She's an international mushroom educator that has been working in the medicinal mushroom industry for years. And this is when she saw firsthand how many other companies take shortcuts when it comes to their products. And Jamie wasn't having it. She set out to build her company the right way. Whole Sun Wellness is here to raise the industry standards so those crap mushrooms on the market aren't getting into your body or your family's body. Whole Sun Wellness is the first company to test and report nutritional facts for all of their extracts. They go beyond industry standards every step of the way, from sourcing to extraction and final testing. And as the owners of the largest medicinal mushroom farm in the United States, Whole Sun Wellness is taking control of their supply chain for the highest quality and absolute full transparency. They're even the first company to include pure mycelium extract in every single product. So when you're thinking of getting medicinal mushrooms for you and your family, Whole Sun Wellness is exactly the ones you want. Also, be sure to check out their new Mycolites. These are the world's first dissolvable electrolyte tablets. They're featuring functional mushroom extracts that'll give you more energy, more stamina, and recovery as well. And who couldn't use all of that? 
The other thing is they are these adorable little mushroom shaped tablets and they come in like a little Altoids box, but way cooler than Altoids because they're mycolites. Anyways, head to wholesunwellness.com to grab yourself some mycolites and all of the other functional medicinal mushrooms that you and your family need. And of course, you can grab that link right here in the show notes now. Well, you know, I think the first sign is when your housemates tell you you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> your bottles are covering the kitchen. Right. All the shelves. Um, and, you know, honestly, like, I think that there are so many people that are herbalists. And right. I actually, I taught a couple classes this week and I opened up both of them with saying, I'm an herbalist and that simply means that I use herbs for their medicinal properties and you are an herbalist too, even if there's just one plant that you use medicinally, even if it's yeah. just your ginger tea when you're sick or peppermint to calm your stomach or mm -hmm. chamomile to calm you down or whatever, like you are an herbalist. So Hell yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that we have a lot of herbalists walking amongst us and mm -hmm. that yeah, it just takes a lot of it's hard, especially as, you know, someone who's socialized female to step up and claim an identity when somebody hasn't like, you know, I'm just imagining this like fairy wand, like waved over you being like, poof, you're an herbalist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so right. it's hard to own it. It's mm -hmm. hard to step up be like, okay, I can tell people I'm an herbalist. I can put myself out there as an herbalist. I can start seeing clients for health consultations. Mm -hmm. My stuff is good enough to sell, you know, that's that kind of thing. And so for me, a lot of it was that going to Michael Moore's school um, helped me own that because I knew that that was a really in-depth program. You know, it was, it was kind of a sick, assigned to myself that I was moving across the country for six months to study too, you know? Right. Yeah, for sure. So I, I never got to study with Michael Moore, but many of my teachers have. So I, I feel like a lot of his lessons and learnings have been passed down to me. What would you say his, um, I don't know, level or class or style of herbalism teaching was, you know, I've been to various herbal schools myself, some are over here and some are over there, you know, some are super woo-woo, hippy-dippy, some of them are super clinical. Um, what was going on with Michael Moore? Here was a pretty wild child. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was definitely a uh witness to him in his more sedate years. <laughs> so yeah. I never got to see him stay up for a whole weekend on cocaine writing a symphony and then see it played the next week. But <laughs> I do know someone who did that. Nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and you know, I will say I loved Michael and I am so glad that I got to study with him and I learned a ton from him. And I want to say that he actually wasn't the most gifted teacher that I've studied with. You know, Krista is an amazing teacher. Krista Olson, Colette Gardner is an amazing teacher. Um, and so I think that I just like to put that out there because we do a lot of this, like putting people on pedestals, especially mm -hmm. ones that we don't have access to, you know, they're dead or they're right. across the country or, you know, whatever. And so I like to be clear about that while I learned a ton. Um, you know, he was a unique fellow right. <laughs> and he went off on tangents and some people hated that, but I definitely learned a lot more about rancid fats than I ever thought I would ever learn. <laughs> <laughs> Way too many firsthand lessons. <laughs> <laughs> or just like long rants about the kinds of rancid fats that people love <laughs> and oh, how so they funny. put them in their body and stuff. Um, but he would... He went through the um, Herbs by Alphabet mm -hmm. by Latin name. And so I have three books from studying with him, three notebooks. One is everything that begins with A. Mm -hmm. One is B through, I think, G maybe or F. 
and the other is the entire rest of the alphabet because he spent so long talking about that beginning of the alphabet that he rarely got to the end. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> All the tangents. I totally get that. I've, I've had my tangenty teachers and such. Um, yeah. So on that note, like to you, what makes a great herb teacher if somebody's out there looking to go to the next level and you know they've they've got the books or they're listening to this podcast or they're you know doing all the online things that are there to you what is something that makes a great herbal teacher for you for missy for missy okay those are two separate questions right because I they are think- okay let's go with the other people first and then we'll go with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait no no let's reverse that let's go with you first and then to the other people Cool. Because, yeah, we all have different learning styles and we're all Mm going to, you know, vibe different with different teachers. And so I think that that's great. Yeah. Um, I think the main thing is that you always want a teacher who's willing to say, I don't know. Yes. Um, (laughs) And all of my teachers were willing to say that, which I'm glad about. Um. Although I will admit that Michael was a pure genius and there were a few things he didn't know, but he would certainly own it when he didn't. Um, And, you know, for me, I really like to look for folks who um, try to engage with people on different kinds of levels. So Mm -hmm. for instance, when I teach, like I do a little lecturing with Materia Medica, like how to use the herbs. Mm -hmm. Um, We play some games where people move around so that they're like kind of using their bodies and interacting with each other. We'll make medicines that were hands-on. Grady will take them out into the field and like they'll get to meet plants. Yeah. um, Experience the weather. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Oregon. (laughs) It's rainy. You're going to hate it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, So for me, I really like to try to engage people on like different levels like that. And I think that helps, helps people to be good teachers. But, um, but yeah, just I think, being organized about what you're presenting Mm -hmm. and yeah yeah and that I think that uh, for me a key piece is like can I resonate can I sit and listen to this person talk and tolerate it (laughs) because I've had herb teachers where I've been like okay dude (laughs) I'm done (laughs) I can't (laughs) listen to you anymore um you're listening to you sort of no (laughs) but um yeah I I think that for me that's a big piece like oh cool all right I I can hang out with this person for a while and learn with them um yeah yeah awesome and what works for some people doesn't always work for others because I can't do powerpoints like I hate them as a learner and I won't inflict them on anyone else I just fall the asleep. Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Like I want to touch things. My my background's in environmental and experiential ed before I got all immersed into herbalism and like I need to touch it, see it, feel it, do it. Like let me do this, yeah. <laughs> you know. But some people really appreciate those powerpoints. Um yeah. so I agree with you on like having a combination of touch points where you can educate people and um that's a really really good piece. Um so it sounds to me like some of your most influential teachers in the beginning were Krista Olson and Colette Gardner and Michael Moore. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, the study of herbalism is never ending. And that's what I love (laughs) about it. Um, I think that's where I was finally like, oh shit, something that can challenge me for the rest of my life. No more boredom. (laughs) Awesome. Um, Do you have any teachers that are particularly influential for you in your much, much later stages of being an herbalist oh boy you know um the last few years um I've been crushing hard on Julie James like I love watching her her Monday morning Facebook classes that Mm -hmm. you can just tune in for an hour or so and she um she just has science brain but will explain things on a very like chill pragmatic understandable level 
Nice. So I love that. And I learned so much because I've literally never taken a chemistry class in my life. So here, here. <laughs> the yeah. most I've gotten is my herbal <laughs> studies. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's definitely one place where I'm always going to have so much to learn. And Julie is brilliant at. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, met her this year at the Brighton Bush Herbal Conference, and I love that woman. <laughs> it was really great yeah. to connect with her and to know that she had carried my own herbs. <laughs> They're like, she she knew my products, and I was like, oh, yay! <laughs> and then to see that she was a keynote, and I was like, oh, or yeah, <laughs> okay, neat, you know, after we had just connected on a mutually, hey, we're great people kind of basis. That was cool. Yeah. Yeah. I might have cut you off if you were going to name another person or two. Maybe you weren't. Oh, yeah. I mean, wow. There's so many people out there. I know. Uh, um, I'm always learning stuff from Lydia Bartholo whenever oh, yeah. I talk with her. And whenever I see her speak, she's brilliant. So brilliant. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, and I love, I absolutely love that in our longer program um, at Arctos, we have enough room finally, now that we expanded it, to have guest teachers. Yay. So, like, it's my secret mission that I get to, like, plug all the guest teachers in there that I want to learn from. Heck yeah. <laughs> so, like, Isn't it great have, running your own thing? <laughs> exactly. Like, okay, this is really going to benefit me. And the people that are using whatever it is that I've got going to my school in your case. Yeah. yeah. And I bet you get to make like the next lotion that you really want for you or whatever. And then you're like, oh yeah, I can rip that. You know, I actually haven't started a new product in so long because I went the path of learn about business and that shit's nowhere near as much fun as learning about herbalism so like um I got way in over my head for quite a while and overwhelmed <laughs> and like whoa okay I'm gonna kick it right here yeah I'm full of ideas all the time but it takes time and money and effort to launch a whole new product so I am about to launch our full spectrum hemp line so the world will be hearing about that soon at least starting it, starting with some topicals, and then I've got some great formulas for some tinctures, but I'm going to hold up, wait a minute, <laughs> just <laughs> take it easy getting in there, um, but I'm excited for that. Yeah. But this podcast is one of those things, like I really, really, like with Mountain Mouths, one of my missions is to inspire people to take better care of our planet by taking better care of themselves naturally. And I do truly believe that there needs to be an herbalist in every home. And I have a really special story I'll share with you another day and I might share it, I will share it on this podcast eventually, but about Cascade um, and connecting with her and some words that she had to say to me and I'm like okay I'm re I'm bringing those back and a lot of it is about having the voice and the power to shout it from the the mountaintops and the treetops about the importance of using plants as medicine um messages she gave to me for two weeks after she passed in my dreams very directly very powerful holy shit at a time yeah. when I was like yeah people don't talk to you when, when they're dead oh <laughs> Yeah, they do. <laughs> she was very much talking to me. Um, I really, I just have to say, I agree. Like Cascade after she passed, I also dreamed of her. And like, I'm not much of a like messages dreamer. And I don't right. always remember my dreams. And yeah, I totally like got to go through my own morning process, like mostly in my sleep, honestly. And that was really amazing and special. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, she's she's powerful. That's for sure. <laughs> um, so we got a little little heavy into like, hey, I'm Irby and I've been doing this for a long time, but I'd love to take it back down to maybe the first herbal recipe you mm. ever remember making. Can you take it back that far? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do remember the first tincture I was involved in making because I was still in college and my college had one of those like January mini sessions like some colleges do where you like have the students teaching things or like alumni teaching things or whatever that are, you know, just little workshops, one-offs. And 
one alumnus came to campus and taught a class on making tinctures and his name was Garth Call. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he doesn't remember me, but I definitely remember <laughs> Garth. And he brought some fresh echinacea root and we made an echinacea tincture together. And then of course it had to steep for a while. And I happened to live in the dorm where we were letting it steep and nobody else from that class came back to help press it. So my partner and I <laughs> had this whole like half gallon jar of echinacea tincture to keep us going through the whole winter. Nice very effective and made me believe in herbs. Awesome. So if you were talking to somebody that had no clue what echinacea was, had no clue about herbalism, what would you tell them that echinacea tincture was for? I wanted to take a quick pause to show some love and gratitude to our sponsors of the Herbalist Path podcast, who make this show possible for me and possible for you too. So here it goes. I love this time of year. It's spring, the sun is shining, and all of our beautiful plant friends are popping up. It's amazing. Unless, of course, you're one of the millions of people who suffer from seasonal allergies. You know, the itchy, watery eyes, the sneezing and wheezing that's straight miserable. Thankfully, there are some amazing herbs that can help you with all of that. Just like the herbs inside of Kick-Ass Allergy from Wish Garden Herbs, one of my absolute favorite herbal companies out there. Kick-Ass Allergy, yes, I said ask without the K at the end. Anyways, this formula has yerba santa, nettles, echinacea for that immune support, and orange peels, all which come together to help dry up those excessive mucosal secretions. Yep, I'm talking about the sniffles and the stuffy nose, the watery eyes, and all that jazz. This blend also acts as a great expectorant and can help ease the swelling and inflammation in those mucosal tissues. It is a top go-to for seasonal allergies. And get this, they combine all those beautiful herbs with glycerin, so it actually tastes pretty darn good. Or should I say it tastes kick-ass without the K at the end. Anyways, if allergy season is miserable for you and you want a natural remedy that actually works for those itchy eyes and being all sneezy and wheezy, you have got to check out Wish Garden Herbs Kick Ask Allergy. And for those of you with the little kiddos, no sweat, they've got a kick it allergy too. And you pregnant mamas? You don't have to suffer either. They've got a kick-ass allergy formula just for you. So head over to wishgardenherbs.com or check out the link in the show notes and go grab yourself some kick-ass allergy so you can enjoy spring again. Yeah. Um, the short story with echinacea is that it just really improves, it boosts your immuni immunity, like it turns it up to, you know, eight or 10 or so, and just helps your white blood cells to fight stuff off. So mm -hmm. I'll take it whenever I'm feeling like susceptible to something, but also unlike some other herbalists, like I will definitely take it while I'm also suffering with something like a cold or whatever. Right. Um, because it's still important to have your immune system be like, Hey buddy, go, go, go. Yeah. Um, and I, I love it. for bad guys out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I love when I take good quality echinacea tincture and something now is so satisfying about that tingle on the tongue. And yeah. I'm like, yes, <laughs> boom, I got good stuff here. Um, for those of you out there that don't know, if you're taking echinacea tincture and you don't get a crazy tingle on your tongue, you could probably find some better medicine elsewhere. <laughs> um, so if you could recommend one recipe to complete beginning herbalist, what would you say to make? I know that can be a very, very broad question, but if you were to just pick one thing that's going to make somebody be like, hell yeah, I can make herbs at my, or, you know, be an herbalist in my house. Yeah. 
Um, you know, I honestly think it can be anything. And I really recommend to folks that they work with like one herb at a time when they're first starting out just to feel what the effects of that particular herb are instead of like mixing everything together right away and being like, oh, I kind of like something in there and I kind of don't and I don't know what which thing I'm resonating with and which thing's turning my stomach or whatever. Um, so, you know, it could be a nettles infused vinegar or it could be like some hawthorn tincture or it could be just like a plantain poultice. Like anything is going to be anything can be a good gateway. And when people are excited about like making stuff at home, I'll just throw one of Rosemary Gladstar's books in front of them because she has just so many good, easy, accessible remedy, like recipes. Absolutely. Yeah. So to play off of that right there, I was going to ask you like what, um, if you were to recommend one book to somebody that's like, hey, <laughs> this is awesome. And I know that's hard because I also have shelves and shelves full of herb books. Um, <laughs> but if it were just one, it would probably be a Rosemary Gladstar book, I'm imagining. But maybe it's not. Maybe you've got something different to say. What would you tell someone to get? I mean, definitely there's never just one um, unless there's like a specific thing that they're looking for. Right. Um, but yeah, whenever I do go give like a very intro herbalism talk, um, I'll usually bring along about four or five books. And one is usually that Rosemary Gladstar's uh, Herbal Recipes for Vibrant, Vibrant Health mm -hmm. um, or Family Herbal, depending on how long ago you bought your book. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I really love Rosalie de la Forêt's uh, mm -hmm. Alchemy of Herbs. I mm -hmm. think that that's a very accessible book and especially great for folks who are using kitchen magic as like their gateway drug to herbalism. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, those are great ones. Excellent. I, I've got them all. <laughs> um, cool. Well, if you could, if you could pick one herb that you wish everybody knew about, <laughs> what would that one herb be? That's a tough one too. I know. <laughs> I mean, it would definitely be weeds, like some kind of weed. So mm -hmm. I'll just go ahead and choose dandelion because it grows most places on the continent and you know, our weeds, our prolific introduced plants provide so much medicine. Almost always there's a, the medicine is the reason that they were brought to where they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're abundant. So let's use them instead of poisoning them. Like that's, yeah, that's my big thing. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So if somebody were to listen and be like, hey, I got dandelion all over in my yard. Um, what, what, what's one way that they could use dandelion in their lives? <laughs> I like that you're like, what's one way that they it's could hard. use it? It's because <laughs> I know we could talk like for like the next 20 podcast. years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say those leaves, especially when they're young in the early spring, make for good eating. And so um, they are bitter. Mm -hmm. And if you want to cook them, I say take some inspiration from a conventional French way of cooking them, which is that the French will sometimes cook them in bacon fat and then put some vinegar or lemon on top. And so the things that are going on with that, you don't have to eat bacon to do this, mm -hmm. um, is that they're adding oil, they're adding salt, and they're adding acid. And all those three flavors will help balance out the bitter without mm -hmm. canceling it out. Yeah. And so like lay on the butter or the olive oil, like throw in some saltiness, like put on your favorite, you know, a thick citrus or vinegar and embrace that bitterness while you're, you know, again, like balancing it out with some other strong tastes. Heck yeah. That's great advice. Um, why would somebody want to bring dandelion leaves into their body? Um, dandelion leaves are just super, super mineral rich. So that's my biggest thing that I love about them. Um, but also they're really bitter and that bitter taste is so important for us as humans to taste on our tongue and our society has done a great job of sidelining that taste and kind of negating it from our, um, from our diets and just tasting that bitterness on your tongue sends messages to your brain 
that food's coming. And then your brain in turn sends messages to your entire digestive system. And it's like, hey guys, hey guys, food's coming. So get the juices going. So your saliva starts going, your um, stomach acid starts going, your pancreatic fluids start pumping, your bile starts going, like all of it. And then you digest your whole meal better and you get more minerals and more nutrients out of that food. So that's a big one. <laughs> yep, definitely a key piece. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, that's all fantastic advice and wisdom for anybody who wants to start heading down the herbalist path. Would you do anything different if you were to start your herbal path over? Whoa. That's heavy. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, well, you know, I might go back and take that chemistry class in high school that I didn't take, you know? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right? For sure. I am on that page. Yeah. <laughs> there is you know, that. I since I could like test out of things, I should just like not bother taking them. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. That's yeah. a great piece right there. I think that's absolute genius from another person who's never actually taken a real chemistry class. Um, <laughs> um, I do have Lisa Ganora's book, but it's even, it's a great book. Um, what is it called? Do you, do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, the one about herbal constituents. I don't remember the name. I but think that it might be, be like herbal constituents. That might yeah. be it. <laughs> or chemistry of herbal constituents or something along those lines. I have the book, but I, I think maybe because I didn't take chemistry either that... I don't really follow it all the time. I know I need to, you know, and just, yes, I like that you would take chemistry <laughs> if you were to start that path over. Um, so is there any other like big pieces of wisdom or advice you'd like to share with somebody that's beginning on their herbalist path? Um, you know, I, I would say, Again, like you are an herbalist, as soon as you start using herbs as medicine, you are an herbalist, so keep doing it. Hell yeah. Um, while you need to know your limitations, like keep on experimenting, you know, don't, don't be so foolish as to just put random shit in your mouth that you find in your backyard because you don't know that that's safe. But once you do know that it's safe, like experiment with things. Heck yeah. Um, Heck yeah play around with it, get to know the plants. Right. Where are they going to find out if it's safe? Um, you know, I really encourage folks to take just some like basic plant ID, some field botany, you know, again, you don't have to like go to your local like community college or whatever. You can take an herbalism course or you mm -hmm. can get involved in your local forest defense group. Mm -hmm. um, and start learning a little bit of basic botany so that you can start learning about plant ID and plant families. And um, along the way, you will find some good resources in plant ID books and such that will help you figure out whether plants are edible, medicinal, poisonous, or kind of like none of the above. Like, not great yeah. to eat, but won't kill you either. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you might want to find somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Totally. That is awesome. Thank you so much. You've, you've provided a lot of great wisdom and information here. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, this The Herbalist Path, this podcast is all about creating a movement where there is an herbalist in every home. What's the greatest reason that you think there should be an herbalist in every home? Basically, just because it's empowering. I mean, I'm an anarchist, and I think that people have the power to work together to take care of our communities, and we don't need to rely on bosses to tell us what to do. And likewise, you know, I appreciate expertise. Like, I think it's really important that we do have you know, medical doctors and surgeons and nurse practitioners and PAs and all of that for times when we need them. Right. Um, but that most of the things that we encounter as humans are things that we can handle very well in the home, whether it's colds or menstrual cramps or like leg cramps or headaches or 
the blues, like, you know, mm. seasonal affective symptoms or whatever, like if you're well, well enough educated on some basic things, you can, you can be that resource for your community. And I like to make an analogy to cooking. Mm-hmm. Like almost everybody can cook at least a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you occasionally meet a person who can't even boil an egg and that's okay too. But, you know, almost everybody can do some basic cooking and then it takes talent and or practice to become really great at it, right? Right. Usually a combination of both. But almost everybody can do a little bit. And some people have like some really great specialties. Like by the time I finished high school, I was well known for my chocolate chip cookies, you know? And so everybody like will be able to master at least a few things fairly well and share that with their community. And herbalism is just the same. Like everybody can do at least a little bit of herbalism. And, you know, if you decide to like really apply yourself, you could become like really amazing at it and have an apothecary of like 500 herbs that you can use with precision or whatever. But you can also just start to get to know dandelion and hawthorn and, you know, big wart or something rando like that. And Mm -hmm. just have an apothecary of like five things that you know how to use really well. Heck yeah. That's awesome. (laughs) <laughs> this is really fun. I'm so glad I had you as my first podcast guest. Um, you're, yeah, I absolutely love this. I'm excited for this next path. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add about a, an herbalist beginning on their path right now? Or We did cover a lot, I know. Yeah, I mean... Oh man, I'm sure there's going to be like five things that I think of as soon as we hang up that I'm like, (laughs) you herbalists should really know this. Um, But, you know, just have fun. Like, I really appreciate herbalism as a way to connect with other people and as a way to connect with the earth. Yeah. And for me, it's been life changing that way. And, um, you know, I just invite people to let that happen if that's going to happen for them. Awesome. That is excellent. Thank you so much, Missy. Um, I want everybody to know where they can find you since you happen to be a fantastic herbal teacher out of the Portland, Oregon area. Um, So if people wanted to connect with you, how can they do that? Yeah, um, they can Google me, Missy Rose. My last name is R-O-H-S. Or um, go to arctoschool.org. And arctos, just to have people stick it in their minds, is Greek for bear, because bears are really good herbalists. So it's A-R-C-T-O-S school.org. And then you can check out the programs we offer and any upcoming plant walks or workshops that we've got. Sweet. Yeah, I know you also teach with Grady, who was definitely a key piece in the beginnings of my herbal learnings as a botany teacher, and he's just really fantastic in that way also. So I bet it's a a really fun team between the two of you and the other people you have coming on board. Um, Are there any social media pages that people could follow you or Arco School or anything like that? Yeah, Arctis has a Facebook page, so you can find us there. Um, And then, yeah, I have both a personal Facebook page, a personal Instagram page, and I should have an Arctis Instagram page, so keep your eyes peeled for that someday. (laughs) (laughs) And folks are certainly welcome to follow me there. I do try to announce classes there. Um, We also do have a Portland Meetup page um, on Meetup. You can go find the Portland Herbalists group, and we've got our workshops up there, too. Very, very, very cool. Thanks so much, Missy. Fun. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited to share it. Um, yeah, thank you. Wow, that was so much fun. I can't think of a better person than Missy Rose to help me launch the first episode of The Herbalist Path and help me get over the jitters of being a new podcaster. 
and help me to inspire this movement of having an herbalist in every home again. Missy is so perfect for that mission. So I hope you dug her as much as I do. I hope you go check her out at thearctoschool.org. She and Grady are both phenomenal teachers. They're super hands-on. You'll get dirty. You'll play with medicine. You'll go out into the field with them and really learn about the plants around you and how to use them as medicine um yeah definitely check out missy and i'm so grateful that you guys listen to this podcast and i want to offer all of the podcast listeners that's you a 20 percent discount at mountainmels.com so if you're really craving some functional herbal teas that aren't only like great for your health but actually good for your taste buds too or you need some herbal first aid goods or bug sprays so when you're out on your next hike checking out the cool plants you can feel good about what you're putting on your body definitely head over to mountainmels.com and use the code the herbalist path and you will get 20 percent off just for being a listener of this podcast and helping to inspire this movement where there's an herbalist in every home You guys are freaking awesome. I'm so grateful you've listened this long. And if you love this episode, I really, really hope that you subscribe to it. And please leave us a rating, hopefully a five-star one. And definitely, definitely share this with your friends. So this mission to have an herbalist in every home again can spread like wildflowers. Thanks so much, everybody. You rock. Have a gorgeous day. Bye. It has been so much fun and so, I don't know, joyous watching all of my medicinal plant friends popping up in my garden from the Elecampane to the Comfrey and the Arnica. I love seeing these friends pop up. And if you are still trying to decide what to grow in your medicinal herb garden, you've got to grab my guide. It's all about the most essential herbs that every mom should know and should grow. So I teach you how to grow them and the many different ways that you can use them. If you want to grab the guide, go ahead. It's free and I'm pretty sure you're going to get a lot of delight and use out of it. And there's a link to it in the show notes. I'm wishing you tons of happy medicine planting.